So we are honored to have with us uh, tonight a distinguished Syrian-born, Göttingen-based historian and political thinker, Professor Bassam Tibi. Scores of scholarly books and a multitude of media appearances over the past 40 years have secured Professor Tibi's place as one of the most influential observers of the Middle East in our times. The uprising in the Middle East and North Africa continued uh, uh, 2011, continued uh, to throughout uh, 2013, has been adopted Arab Spring. Well, we know that spring is the most beautiful season of the year, but if you consider the outcome, you ask why, why, why spring? Um, the answer to this question is uh, people said the Middle East is now joining world history. This is a term uh, used by uh, Thomas Friedman in the New York Times. The Middle East is now joining world history, and that's why it's a spring. But the spring turned out to be a lethal and a bloody winter. Uh, there was no democratization, but in, at the beginning of the Arab Spring, people hoped that this will be a joining of world history. This will be joining of the global wave of democratization. Arab Spring turned into a bloody, lethal winter, and it is also a catastrophe for religious minorities. Why? I shall explain this later. Um, I shall address the issue in uh, five steps, uh, five sections. The paper is based uh, on five sections, and uh, uh, I will try to keep the time for each section about uh, 10 minutes. Yeah? And it is based on the book when I left the stage after leaving Yale, but then uh, I, I could not keep the promise. I wrote the book, The Sharia State, Arab, uh, Arab Spring and Democratization. Uh, to explain what's going on, especially I am a, I am a, a born Damascene, I'm, I'm native Syrian, born in Damascus, and I spent uh, the first period of my life till the age of 18 in Damascus, and now the Syrian Air Force, the Syrian National Air Force, that is uh, supposed to protect the country from evils, whatever evil, this is what the propaganda of the state, it is now uh, 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 bombing the, the residential area of Damascus, I including the places in Damascus where I grew up. So how can I keep silent? Um, on page uh, one, uh, one, uh, 147 of my book, The Sharia State, uh, you can read uh, uh, on that page this information. Uh, when the uh, Islamist president uh, in Egypt, uh, Mohammed Morsi, was elected, uh, the then, uh, the then uh, Secretary of the State, Hillary Clinton, rushed from Washington to uh, Cairo to endorse him. She rushed to Cairo to endorse him, and she was received, among others, by demonstrations of the Christian mi uh, minority of Egypt. In Egypt, there, there's a Christian minority, the Copt minority, uh, between 10 and 12 uh, percent. Uh, in 10 to 12 percent of Egyptians are Christians, and um, uh, they were demonstrating against uh, Clinton uh, because she came to endorse uh, the uh, Islamist president Turkey, uh, the uh, Morsi. Uh, she was rebuffed by protesting members of the Christian minority who did not share her uh, conviction that uh, the Islam Muslim brothers who are now were ruling the country uh, are introducing a form of democracy. Uh, and they were suffering under the Muslim Brothers. And they were carrying banners like, uh, Clinton, go home, you are not welcome in Egypt. Yeah? This is not anti-American, this is to, make, to be sure. This is only a protest <coughs> against the American policy. Uh, the United States was, and it still is, supporting uh, Islamist movement. But this was not always the case. Uh, earlier, uh, under Bush, uh, and I, uh, I was happy uh, I mean, when, when uh, Obama was elected, but I was a supporter of Obama, but I do not do the, uh, this anymore. Uh, the, the w there was a war against terror, and the, the war against terror was a, actually a war against Islam. At the time, I was, uh, I was professor at Cornell University. I, I moved from Harvard to Cornell. And every time I entered the United States with my German passport, I had to go through a second inspection with humiliation uh, and in intimidation, and I said, why I'm coming here to this country? This is, was, America was my, my dream country. And after 9-11, uh, 
America no longer was my, my dream country. So there was, there was an Islamophobic atmosphere, but suddenly under Obama, this is, Obama uh, held two speeches, one in Ankara and the other is in Cairo, and said, we end the war between the United States and Islam, which is wonderful, yeah? uh, but it seemed that this end of, of war with, uh, about, uh, but, I mean, the war and terror was a war against Islam. It became suddenly a cooperation with the Islamist movement. I am not against uh, cooperation with the Islamist movement, and I shall elaborate on this, but the question is, why, why this change? Yeah? Um, there are two questions to be asked, and then I move to the first section of my presentation. Um, the coverage, uh, uh, the coverage of, the, uh, uh, of the way Hillary Clinton was received in Cairo um, and the introductory remarks that I have been doing, uh, they imply these two questions. First, the U.S. support for Islamism um, uh, after Arab Spring and the question why this, why the change from, from a fighting radical Islam, so-called, this is not my language, the fight against radical Islam, quote unquote. Why this changed from the fight against radical Islam uh, to a cooperation with the Islamist movement? Yeah? What happened? What happened to induce a U.S. shift from combating what is named radical Islam to an embrace of Islamist rule? The Islamist rule is the Sharia state. What the Sharia state is is uh, a part. If you read the uh, uh, the structure of the presentation, one 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 section of my presentation is about the Sharia. The second question is the place of minorities, in particular Christian minorities, in the Middle East. The, uh, those who study the Middle East, and I, as you know, I, uh, as, uh, as you heard me, I, I have been doing that for, for 40 years. In my home city, Damascus, 20% of the population of Damascus uh, is Christian. In Baptuma is the Christian part of Damascus. And in my class, uh, we had Christians. I had Christian friends. And Christians had no problems. In, in Damascus is a tolerant place. The Kurds, there's a Kurdish section in Damascus. We, we were friends with, with, with Armenians. Armenians found refuge in Damascus. Uh, Armenians, Kurds, uh, Christians. And, but the things are changing. Yeah? Um, the, the Middle East is not a good place for Christians, and Christians are leaving the Middle East uh, by large. Yeah? Uh, there's a kind of de-Christianization of the Middle East uh, that the Christian minorities are leaving to the West, to Europe and to the United States. So what happened? Why the issue is requires a distinction between uh, the religious face of Islam. Islam is a religion, it's not a political ideology. Islam is not also a political religion. Some people in the West say Islam is by definition is a political religion. I do not buy into this. Yeah? Um, and uh, the politicization of Islam to an ideology makes out Islamism. And Islamism is not Islam. And this is the subject matter of the other book, the Yale book, Islamism and Islam. Now I move to part one. Um, what is uh, Arab Spring and uh, the place of Islamist movement in the uprising and the outcome for democracy, not only for democracy, this is a general question, but also a particular question given my, uh, the invitation uh, to speak here at uh, Christian Solidarity International, the place of minorities, in particular the Christian minorities in the Middle East. Yeah? Um, well, uh, there are three basic facts. I start with these three basic facts. First, MENA, MENA Middle East and North Africa, is the only world region that did not join a global, uh, the, the global democratic wave. Uh, my Harvard colleague, who is also defamed in Europe for really not, not for uh, just reasons, uh, his book, Clash of Civilization, is a problematic book, and I, I criticize this book, and I have an evidence for this. With, the former, with one of the former presidents of Germany, uh, Roman Herzog was in office 1999, uh, and he asked me to join him in writing a book against Huntington. Yeah? And at the time, I was Bush Harvard professor. So I, uh, I was in the fifth floor, and Huntington was in the fourth floor in Coolidge Hall, Cambridge Street. Yeah? Uh, uh, I, I, I wrote and published a book with Roman Herzog under the title Preventing the Clash of Civilizations. And to give you an idea, this ha the Huntington, now the late Huntington, God bless him, uh, was a decent person. He gave me a phone call and he said, Bassam, uh, I, I saw your book with, written with your president, 
uh, Roman Hertu, uh, and I need to talk to you. Would you like to have lunch with me in Harvard Faculty Club? Sit by all means. And before we went to Harvard Faculty Club, and before we uh, started uh, uh, to be seated, and he asked me, what is your problem? What is the problem of your president? And I said, it is, the question is very simple. The problem is, I, dis I and my president, Roman Herzog, we disagree with you. There is, we are against, against clash of civilizations, and we go for preventing it. So I will not go into this in detail on this, but Huntington wrote, after the end of the Cold War, a very magnificent book, The Third Wave, The Third Wave of Democratization. He argued uh, history, modern history, uh, consists of three periods the for, uh, w with respect to democracy. After the French Revolution, there was the first wave of democratization. After, after uh, fighting Hitler and, and, and uh, 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 ending the Nazi rule in Germany and in Europe, there was a second wave of democratization that included even Germany. Germany today, I, I can tell you, Germany, my home country of today, is more democratic than is the United States. Believe me, this is true. Yeah? The, es gibt mehr Rechtsstaatlichkeit in Deutschland als in den Vereinigten Staaten von Amerika. Yeah? And this is, this is an outcome of the second wave of democratization. And then there was a, a third wave. I'm just, this is the argument of Huntington. Uh, the third wave after the fall of the uh, Berlin Wall and the breakdown of communism, there's a third wave. But there's, a, there's an agreement among experts on the Middle East that the Middle East succeeded in not, not joining the third wave. But Arab Spring has a, was a promise, I mean, a few decades after it, from 1989 till 2011, uh, this is a long period of time, uh, Arab Spring was a promise to join this third wave of democratization. Yeah? Um, well, it started the issue, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you the story, I hope you know it. Uh, it started in uh, December 2010. I just returned from the United States to Europe at the time, and uh, was, uh, um, um, uh, the, the, there was a humiliation of, uh, of a Tunisian person in, in a village uh, uh, near uh, Tunis, and he, he protested in burning himself. And then, uh, that was the beginning of Arab Spring, and it started in tu Tunisia. In Tunisia, there were huge demonstrations without violence, and within a few weeks, the president of uh, Tunisia, Ben Ali, who is a police officer, uh, he fled the country. Yeah? Uh, then it was followed in Egypt. Also, in a uh, in, in, in few weeks, uh, uh, the army uh, decided, I mean, there were millions of Egyptians demonstrating through the country, between three and five million Egyptians in Tahrir uh, Square uh, was the center. And then uh, uh, President Mubarak was toppled by the army. Well, the, the, there were demonstrations, but the demonstrators could not could not uh, uh, could not uh, coerce uh, uh, coerce uh, Mubarak and compel him to, uh, to leave office. It was the army, and by then it was called revolution. But uh, this year, when the, the same army uh, toppled Morsi, uh, the press, the Western press, talked about putsch, about coup d'état. Yeah, but I mean. Uh, but, but they did the same what they did to Mubarak, they did it to Mursi. Yeah? And then uh, you had uh, Libya. Libya is a very complicated case. I will talk about it later. And, uh, but uh, there were also Bahrain and in Syria since two years. Yeah? Um, at that time, all people spoke about, about uh, uh, democratization. I was, at the beginning of 2011, I was on, uh, live on Swiss television, and I was very careful, and I said, uh, I cannot join uh, your enthusiasm. The participants, the so-called experts, I will not mention names. For me, they were not, not experts. Yeah? Uh, and and, and the, uh, the person who, who was leading the debate, they, were, they, they think a miracle is happening. And I did not share that, and I was, I was sidelined. But I mean, what I said by then uh, on Swiss television, it hap is happening today. Yeah? Um, so the, uh, the reasons for the uh, revolt were not, I mean, we, we have to be honest with ourselves, yeah? Uh, the, the people who went to the streets, they did not go primarily for democracy and for freedom. In the Middle East and North Africa, there is a, there is a, um, um, a, a, a great <coughs> distinction between, you know, the growth of the population. If you look at Cairo, Cairo had, uh, in the year 1900, uh, 1900, 
one million people. Today, Cairo has 20 million. Yeah? The, the Egyptians of today are about between uh, 85 and 90 million. Yeah? A few years ago, they were half of this size. Yeah? So there's a, a, a huge uh, uh, demographic growth, but no development or uh, uh, <laughs> a failed development, at least a failed development. And you have a younger generation with no future, and the, the term was coined for this generation, no future generation. And these are the people who wanted the street, they wanted to have p bread, they wanted to have uh, uh, living room. I mean, the people I mean, in, in Cairo, they live on the street. Yeah? Uh, and they wanted to have decent life. And in, on the second place, uh, in the second ranking, they want to have freedom. Um, uh, and these people were not Islamist. Uh, the bottom line is Arab Spring was not of an Islamist making. And I have very strong evidence, uh, I mean, based on my work in Cairo, uh, that in the first three weeks, or let's say first one, two and a half weeks in Cairo, no Islamist, no single Islamist participated in the demonstrations. And the Islamists, I, can, I do not have the time to talk about this. If you are, you can read an interview that will be published in the next few days in Tagus Anzeiger, where I argue, if you are Swiss and want to join a Swiss party, you can go there and pay the fee and you get your membership, and the next day you are a full member. If you want to be a member of the Muslim Brotherhood, you need eight years. You need full eight years, and you to undergo, you join, the first step is a sympathizer, and there's a system of surveillance, and you are observed until they have confidence in you, you can become a full member after long surveillance. And when you are a member, you never have a view about the, the movement. You are a member of a cell, three, maximally five people, and you don't know the others. And so uh, the top of the movement, they control these, about 5% of the Egyptian population is organized in the Muslim Brotherhood. And therefore, it is a very strong movement. Uh, and they, uh, uh, they instructed their people not, they instructed their people not to join the demonstration in Tahrir Place. Only after the breakdown of the security apparatus, uh, they joined in. And uh, there were negotiations between uh, Islamists and non-Islamists about, about the, uh, the terms of cooperation. I'll talk about this later, yeah? But Islamists, uh, Islamists were not part of the movement, neither in Egypt, nor in Tunisia, nor in Turkey, nor in, uh, no, no, nor, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Libya, and Tunisia, nor in Syria. Yeah? Um, Turkey, I've come to Turkey. Turkey is a very, there are three countries who are now uh, outside uh, uh, players, Turkey, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, and of course the United States. Uh, I'll talk about this international dimension la later. Um, so the features of our spring, young generation, are the people who run the, the rebellion. It was a, a rebellion, not a revolution. I am trained as a political scientist, and we in political science or in, in sociology say revolution means transformation of society and culture. But if you have a change in the faces of the rulers, this is, not, this is not a revolution, this is an uprising rebellion. Uh, something similar. Yeah? At the beginning of the Islamist movement uh, stood outside, fearful of the uh, security apparatus, and also they were taken uh, by surprise. They were not expecting that. Yeah? But at the end, they succeeded in hijacking Arab Spring. Why? And I'll try to give you an answer, but a, a preliminary answer in this first section, and I finished the first section. Now, I'm still talking about what is Arab Spring, and I finished this section um, with uh, uh, presenting some arguments why Islamists were able to hijack Arab Spring. First, they are well organized. There is, uh, in, in, uh, in Arab countries, I see there is no Arab world. Arab world is very different. You see, I am a born Syrian, and I, I, could, I cannot go to Syria. I cannot go to Syria since three, 30 years. Uh, and uh, I, in, 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 uh, in, in, in my book, uh, Arab Spring, I, I, I take the liberty of mentioning a conversation between me and a former German ambassador that I want to mention his name. He was talking in the 1990, now today, I'm sorry to say that, I, I feel today that I'm a nobody. Because, because if you are not in the media, 
people forget you. Take me sometimes one week or two weeks. But in the 1990s, I had a very strong presence in the media. And that uh, uh, I was almost daily or at least weekly, two, three times in, in, in CDF. And also in other, I was here in, with Erich Kiesling is a close friend. And I was in the program of Erich Kiesling many times. So, but th these, these appearances in, telev in television, it was covered by the Syrian Mukhabarat. Mukhabarat is the secret police. And I was also a contributor at least once weekly to the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung and uh, every couple of weeks to the Spiegel and Focus. Yeah? And all these things were reported to Hafez al-Assad, the father of the present, present president. And the, this uh, fa uh, ha uh, Hafez al-Assad, I mean Assad senior, was talking to a, a German ambassador, no name, uh, and he asked him, do you know Bassam Tibi? I, this story is mentioned in my book, yeah? And he said to him, I mean, the, uh, 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 the, the German ambassador had in Germany, say, had den Braten gerochen, yeah? So he, he smelled what he said, no, I never heard of them. He said, no, no, this cannot be true. Uh, he, he's always in television, in, a, in, in, your, in your major newspapers. Uh, uh, tell him, and, and he, he passed this to me, tell him, I want to see him, I want to twist his neck with my own hands, yeah? That was for me a great honor. So you see, I'm a, I'm, I'm a see, you know, the, the, the dictator of Syria. I mean, the, I mean, I, I'm not that important, but uh, I could not go to Syria. But uh, I used to go at least two or three times annually to Egypt. And in Tahrir Place, this is one of the most beautiful part of Cairo. There are nice cafes. We, s we used to sit in a cafes in Cairo. Mubarak was also a dictator, but you see the difference. Uh, when you, when um, we used to sit there and tell jokes about uh, about Mubarak, and there was a wonderful jokes. Egyptian people are wonderful people, and they have a culture of jokes. Yeah, and the uh, even you know the, the secret police heard us telling the jokes, but they did not arrest us. And I never I never been been uh, dispelled out of Egypt, and I uh, delivered free lecture. But there are limits. I mean, you cannot you cannot cross some roadblocks. Yeah, uh, but this is in Syria impossible. Uh, there are three Arab countries that I avoided, uh, Iraq uh, under Saddam Hussein, my home country, Syria, under Hafez al-Assad and then his son, and Gaddafi. But in all other countries, there was no freedom, no democracy, but there was, to some, to some extent, it was possible to go there, not to be arrested at the airport, and to meet people without, uh, uh, without risking uh, uh, an encounter with the secret police. Yeah? So, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, where they were observed by the police, and they were, they were uh, regarded as a security uh, threat. Uh, but they were able, the only, they are the only uh, political direction, the only, and there is no second, they were able to survive the surveillance by the secret police. Why? Remember what I told you that about the secrecy? Uh, they work in the underground as religious yeah? religious, uh, religious uh, uh, groups uh, with high secrecy, uh, very careful, and the, 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 uh, the secret police was not able to, to get inside. This is one reason. The other reason is uh, they were organized in a way that you can, you can reach one cell, two cells, arrest maybe 20 people, but you cannot reach the whole movement. And the third reason is uh, he's uh, uh, Prof Professor Spalman. This is a great honor for me that in, in the front row, Professor Spalman is here. For me, he's number one international relations scholars in your country. He's now retired and he withdrawn. But uh, uh, in, in, in the, in the uh, Institute for Security Study he established, uh, Italo-American is working now, Mr. Lorenzo Vedino. He published a book, The Muslim Brotherhood in Western Europe. So Muslim Brotherhood, establish in Western Europe a very efficient uh, network. And this is one of their strengths. The, the Egyptian secret police, the Tunisian secret police cannot reach out to Western Europe. So they have, they have the underground movement in their countries and the uh, networks in Western Europe. Uh, and uh, third, they have a clear agenda. The people who were demonstrating in Cairo, they were against Mubarak. This is the only thing that united them. But they didn't know what to do, what is after Mubarak, yeah? and what is after Ben Ali. Um, so the Islamists had a clear agenda, um, and uh, they were able to act uh, and uh, to hijack Arab Spring. I move now to the second uh, uh, part of my paper, uh, the Western policies. Yeah? Um, in the introduction uh, uh, to my book, 
uh, uh, I quote two constructs. The first one, uh, uh, in the, there's a journal, journal uh, uh, of religious minorities. Uh, this worry was established. Uh, the journal, uh, journal for, the, uh, for religious freedom, uh, welcomed Arab Spring as a, as a movement of democratization but uh, expressed this worry, said the people who are protesting, they are not only talking about democracy, they are also talking about Sharia. And what does Sharia mean to religious minorities? Well, the, um, the, the, uh, mist, mist, um, uh, the, the author of the editorial uh, of uh, this issue knows what Sharia is, and I will t inform you later what Sharia is, what does it mean to minorities, and he said, uh, this is not a promising gesture that, uh, that uh, in the name of democracy, uh, 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 an interaction will, of Sharia will take place. In contrast to the Journal of uh, Religious Freedom and the worries expressed that I have just have cited, um, the Foreign uh, Policy uh, Commissioner of the European Union, Mrs. Uh, 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 Mrs. Ashton, with all respect to Mrs. Ashton, I must testify as somebody who studied the Middle East from inside and outside, because I am, I, I am, I am, I am an Arab, and I'm, an, I'm a Muslim, and I studied the region from inside, but also from outside at European universities and U.S. universities. I, I must say, with all respects due, Mrs. Anchen is ignorant about the Middle East. She knows nothing about it, yeah? And uh, she, she, she doesn't know what foreign policy is needed. She wrote an article in New York Times and she said, she quotes people who are critical, she doesn't, doesn't mention my name or other names, said, uh, there are people who are critical about Islamism, and she adds, I disagree. And disagree on, on the grounds of, of ignorance. Yeah? And she says, we in the European Union, we need to work with Islamists and the, in the name of democracy. Yeah? Uh, well, I shall not talk about the European Union because my focus uh, when I'm dealing with Western, uh, Western uh, policies is the United States of America. Yeah? Um, uh, it was a promising gesture uh, from President Obama after his election. The first visit outside of the United States was to the Muslim world, first to uh, Ankara to speak there in front of the parliament, and second to Cairo to speak there. And he said, uh, uh, um, um, the, the, there is no war between the United States and Islam. Islam, was, Islam is a religion. So it's the, can, how can you fight? Religion? But I mean, he in, there was there was a civilizational conflict, and this is the war of terror became a war on Islam, and he ended that. Yeah, and that was celebrated, and I was among the people who celebrated him. Yeah, and I said this is uh, wonderful, but I didn't know at the time. Later on, I received the information, because I have also my access to unpublished information. Uh, when he was in Cairo, uh, it was arranged by the American embassy in Cairo that 15, 15 leaders of the Muslim Brotherhood were in attendance, and the secret police of Mubarak got to know that, and they protested, but uh, America is stronger than Egypt. Yeah? And President Mubarak, is, I insist, he said, I insist, and then these people were there. That was ahead of Arab Spring. Yeah? Uh, and uh, that was not a good gesture, yeah? but, but of course, I mean, we, the Muslim brother, brothers are there, we have to be aware of them, but not to upgrade them. They were upgraded. Yeah? Um, the, um, um, uh, a part of my academic uh, career was in the United States, and the, uh, the United States, they talk about human rights, uh, whether democratic or republican, this makes no difference. Yeah? But uh, there is a Harvard, Harvard Journal of Human Rights, and this is the American journal, and I uh, published in the journal, and we were in that journal, Harvard Journal of Human Rights, we were in agreement that the American public policies, uh, foreign policy, is not for the promotion of human rights and democracy in the Middle East. Yeah? It is for American interest. Of course, I mean, every state pursues its own interest. But, but when Americans, uh, American politicians pursue their interests, they, they don't say we are pursuing the national interest of the United States. They say we are pursuing the promotion of democracy. In earlier times, in earlier times, they were supportive for stability. See, above all, stability is like a religion, is above everything. But uh, the, uh, the, the foreign policy priority of uh, maintaining stability was replaced under President Bush uh, with fighting terrorism, the war on terror. The war on terror was, I, I, you know, 
In 2002, I was with the American ambassador in Jakarta, Indonesia, and I fought with him next to the American ambassador to Jakarta against anti-Americanism. And this is my credential. Yeah? But then I said, uh, if you want to fight terror, you have to fight terror in an Islamic American approach. Otherwise, uh, the policy will be derailed, and it derailed. So the war and terror uh, was a war against uh, Muslims like, like somebody like me. I, I go to consult the United States government uh, at, at the Rand Corporation on, on jihadism, and in the airport, uh, they take me to the side uh, as a suspect of terrorism. See, if I w was suspect of terrorism, if I were suspect, how could I, how could I advise your government? Yeah? And uh, I, I talked to government officials, and they said to me, the best thing you do is you shut up, yeah? Because these, these, pr these, these migration officers, they act at discretion, and they could arrest you. You see, but in Germany, no one can arrest me. I, I, I mean, is, Germany is a Reichstag, but is America the Reichstag too? I, I'm not sure. Uh, um, okay, so now the policy has changed from, from maintaining, uh, maintaining, maintaining stability to fighting terrorism. And this did not change. It did not change under President Obama. Yeah? And uh, the difference between Obama and Bush is the following. Bush fought against all Muslims, even though he, I mean, he said, no, we are friends, blah, blah, blah. But uh, President Obama had better advisors, and they told him uh, Islamism uh, uh, is... Uh, uh, well, maybe in the next section I'll tell you more about Islamism, but now uh, in advance. Uh, Islamism is the political interpretation of Islam. It is not the faith of Islam. It is a political ideology. And there are two directions within Islamism. One is peaceful and one is violent. Uh, I, I, in my work, I call the, the peaceful Islamist institutional Islamist because they accept to participate in the game of politics and work in the institutions. And that's why institutional Islamists, they are not moderate, but they are institutional and they forego violence. The jihadist and the Muslim Brotherhood is an example for that. The Muslim Brotherhood is not a jihadist movement. Jihadism is not jihad, because it's, uh, I cannot explain this to you now because <laughs> I would not be able to keep the time. Yeah? Um, jihad in Islam is not terror. Yeah? It is violence, but it's not terror. Jihadism, like Islamism, is something different, and it is, it is terror. And uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is an example for jihadist terrorism. And the United States of America are rightly, and I join this, I support this, they are fighting Al-Qaeda and its terrorism. And I agree to this. Yeah. But they think, I mean, the present government thinks, it is possible to cooperate with peaceful Islamists against jihadist Islamists. And the best partner for this are the Muslim Brotherhood. And that's why is, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood became, became an ally of the United States. And, but in the name of fighting terrorism, which there's nothing wrong of fighting terrorism. And as I said, I go for it. But this is not democracy. But in the name of security and fighting terrorism, uh, they say we are promoting democratization and helping also Muslim Brotherhood uh, to be empowered. Uh, I, uh, um, the United States supports the rule of Islamists because of this reason. And this is a distinction between the policies of the Obama administration and the, jihad, uh, and, and the other administration of uh, President Bush. Yeah. Now I move to the third part of my... Uh, presentation. It is about the Islamist political order, the Sharia state. The question is, uh, what is democracy? Is democracy is only election? Is democracy based on election? I was asked this question today in uh, Swiss radio, and they said, well, there were elections, and it w I, I don't know, it was uh, broadcasted today or tomorrow in Esho that side, uh, and said there were elections, and elections is a, a very important part of democracy, but elections are not enough. And I referred to the fact that Hitler was also elected, and he, Hitler he came to power peacefully, not, not uh, through uh, violence. Yeah? Uh, but uh, of course, without election, there can be no democracy, but democracy uh, requires much more than election. My, my, my great, I, I never met him in person, but intellectually, I mean, or mentally, my, my, my mentor in this field, in democracy, is Karl Popper. And uh, 
for me, in, when it comes to democracy, I'm a, I'm a believer Muslim, and I believe in the Quran. Quran is my holy book. But when it comes to democracy, my holy book is the uh, book, uh, the two volumes by Karl Popper, the, uh, uh, the, the open societies and its enemies. And at the very beginning, Karl Popper makes it clear, democracy is not about the rule of the majority. Democracy is not about the rule of Demo uh, the rule of majority. Democracy is about the prevention of the despotism. And this is not guaranteed there will be no democracy. And the Muslim Brotherhood, they argue we are a democratic movement <laughs> and uh, the majority of the people in Egypt and elsewhere are Muslims. And when we rule on their behalf, so we are, a we are uh, an expression of democratic rule. Um, um, here we have to distinguish between Islamism and Islam. Yeah? Islam is a faith. Of course, Islam has to do with politics, but only in ethical terms. There can be ethical Islamic terms uh, or an eth Islamic ethics of democracy, but if you read the Quran, if you study uh, Islamic tradition, you will, fi you will not find a system of government. The terms dawla, uh, state, does not occur in the Quran. This is modern Arabic. Uh, the term Sharia occurs only once in the Quran, and I know the Quran by heart. And the uh, the term is Wa thumma jalnaka minha Shariatun bil amri fatabiuha. We haven't given you a Sharia, so live after it. This is an ethics. This is not a system of government. Yeah. Um, there are three meanings. Uh, I mean, let's first the distinction: Islam is a faith. Islamism is about political order. In my book, Islamism and Islam. I, I identify six features, six features of Islamism. One of them, I cannot uh, discuss all of them, one of them is the political order. Um, the founder of the Muslim Brotherhood said, Islam is deen wa dawla. Deen means religion and dawla state. It is a combination of order of the state and religion. And so the faith is not only in spiritual, it, uh, the faith is also in the, uh, the faith is also in the political order. And the, the, this political order is a Sharia state. But there is no Sharia state, there is no Sharia order in the Quran. So let's, t uh, and they speak about, when, when you talk with Islamists in Cairo, in the past and today, they, they, they say Al Sharia, the Sharia, with the definite article the, the Sharia. If you study Islamic history and Sharia and Islam, there is no one understanding of Sharia. There are so many different understandings of Sharia. And this is not my, 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 uh, uh, my intention to deal with this at length. But I tell you, there are three meanings uh, of Sharia in Islam. The Quranic meaning, it is eth ethic, ethics. Uh, a Muslim has to be an ethical person. And this is the Sharia of Muslim. It is, it is in, 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 in the language of the Quran, Al-Amru bil-Ma'roof wa nahi al-Munkar, to, to enjoin the good and forbid the evil. This is Sharia. But in the, in, the, in the course of Islamic history, Islam was born in the 7th century. In the course of, of Islamic century, between the 8th and the uh, 20th century, uh, Muslim scholars developed a system of legal, uh, of, uh, of legal rules, and it covers three areas. Worship, uh, in Islam it is uh, uh, ibadat, uh, civil law, mu'amalat, and penal law, uh, hudud. Yeah? Uh, that's all. But it has nothing to do with politics. If you read the history of Damascus, my home city, uh, you will find a chapter on Banu At-Tibi, this is my family, and uh, the, the muftis, this is the highest ranking in Islam, a mufti is the one who issued a fitwa. Fitwa is not the sentence. Fitwa is a legal judgment. Uh, but since, since uh, the, the Rushdi affair, the people in the West think uh, fitwa is death sentence. No, it's not. Yeah. So my, 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 uh, it is le just legal judgment. And a mufti issues a legal sentence. Yeah. So uh, the muftis and the, and the qadis, qadis is a, as the, the, uh, the judge, the, muft the leading muftis and the qadis of Damascus were from Banu Atibi, my family, from the, from the, uh, uh, from the 13th throughout, uh, fr th uh, uh, throughout the 16th century, for 300 years. Yeah? And uh, none, my family had nothing to do with politics. So these were these was legal scholars. Yeah? Uh, but so uh, Sharia has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with politics. So the first meaning of Sharia is ethics in the Quran. The classical Sharia is about uh, civil law and worship. 
And the Islamist Sharia, this is something new that was established with the birth of the Muslim Brotherhood. It is about the order of the state. So the, the core feature of Islamism is the order of the state. If you ask somebody, what is Islam? And this person tells you Islam is, uh, Islam is uh, an order of the state, then you say this is an Islamist or a fundamentalist. In the year 2002, I was among the advisors of the armed forces in the United States ahead of the war of Iraq. And all of us, we were five advisors, we were against the war. I repeat it, we were against the wars. But the generals told us the decision was already taken in Washington, 2002. Yeah? So we convinced the general, don't go to war because there, no, there is no need for war. This is, an, this is, uh, this is a, a war of no need. Yeah? Uh, and uh, I, uh, one of the generals there asked me, uh, I, I will, I'm, not w I'm not willing to read your book, The Challenge of Fundamentalism, and I'm a general, I have no time for reading books. He was honest. Yeah? Can you tell me in one sentence, how can I distinguish between a Muslim and an Islamist? I said, yes. You ask this Muslim, is Islam is a religious faith or is it the order of the state? If he says, it is always he, it's not she. Because, uh, Isla yeah, because Islam is, is, a, is a male chauvinist movement. Yeah? Uh, uh, if he says Islam is a political order, then he's an Islamist. Yeah? And this is the major feature. And it is based on a Sharia. But this is not the traditional Sharia. It is not the Quranic Sharia. Now, what matters this understanding of Sharia and Sharia state? First to minorities and second to democracy. In the Sharia, in the traditional Sharia, uh, there are four uh, patterns of people. There are the uh, people, uh, true Muslims, the true Muslims who comply with the rules of Islam and they subject themselves to the ruler. Uh, then the, there's the munafiqun, hypocrites. Hypocrites are people who say, I'm a Muslim, but they do not comply with the rules. And this is, they, this is considered to be hypocrisy. Uh, so, I mean, if you are critical, so you can be, uh, you run the risk of to be, to be viewed as a hypocrite, munafiq, yeah? Uh, I, I disagree with this, yeah? And then the third category is the kafirun, the infidels, the unbelievers. And these all people who are not Muslims, Christians or Jews are unbelievers. I lived in Southeast Asia, my, my country of orientation in Southeast Asia is Indonesia. I was professor at the Hidayatullah Islamic State University. And I, 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 this is not boosting, but I, because I, I'm very proud of this. I was advisor to the first Muslim, reformers Muslim, the first one in history, who became president of uh, Indonesia, Kustur. This is his nickname. His full name is Abdurrahman Wahid. I was his advisor. And in Indonesia, you have, you have Buddhists, you have Confucians, uh, you have Hindus, but how, but how you, these people, about 15 to 18 percent of the population, are non Muslims, but they are not Christians and not Muslims. Uh, do you treat them as kuffar? No. Indonesia is the most tolerant country in the world of Islam. They are treated as citizens. But by traditional Islamic law, uh, Buddhists, Confucians, uh, uh, Hindus are not, uh, are, not, are not believers. Believers are the, the Muslims, the Christians, and the Jews. The, however, the Christian and the Jews are the fourth category. The fourth category is the dhimmi, dhimmi or dhimmi tut. Yeah? Uh, dhimmi, this is uh, people su who subject themselves to Islam. They are allowed to practice their religion. They are allowed to have synagogues, to have churches, and to live by Christian or by Jewish culture. However, as a second class citizen, they, a, a Christian and a Jew under Islamic rule does not have the same right of a full Muslim. Yeah? And uh, these things, I mean, this is considered to be Islamic tolerance. Maybe in the medieval time, that was better. Uh, uh, Muslim people did not, did not kill the Jews. And the Jews found refuge in the world of Islam, but as a second-class citizen. And my, my, my Jewish friend and teacher at Princeton University, Bernard Lewis, he wrote a book about the Jews and Islam. And he says, it's better, it's really better to be a second-class citizen than, than to be killed. Yeah? So in, in medieval Europe, Jews were killed. Yeah? Uh, and so this is tolerance. But today, we live in the 21st century. Uh, we, need, we need more. We, I mean, we need more than this. Jews and Christians should, are not minorities under the protection of the mitud, and they, they need to be full citizens. So if the Islamists apply the Sharia in Egypt, and this happened also in the one-year uh, presidency of Mercy, uh, President Mercy, this is uh, 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 
12% of the population will be treated as second class people. This is not acceptable. I move now to the fourth section. Uh, the pertinence of Islamist rule to Christian minorities uh, and the difference between Islam and Islamism. Yeah? Uh, again, a reminder of a distinction, the distinction between Islam and Islamism. Uh, for minorities, Islam guarantees the life, the property, uh, and everything of uh, Jewish and Christian minorities if, uh, if they accept to to live as a geschützte Minderheiten, yeah? as protected minorities, being second-class citizens. Yeah? Uh, in Islamism, if you look at Islamism, uh, many Islamists, but not all of them, uh, I have to be fair, uh, many, many Islamists, uh, they, uh, they view Jews as kuffar. And when they talk about the liberation of Palestine, uh, when they talk <laughs> about the, the, the liberation of Palestine, uh, they, 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 they speak of uh, Palestine is today inhabited by Kufar. But by Islamic law, Jews are not, are not infidels. They are believers, but they are second-class uh, believer. Uh, the explanation, uh, uh, I cannot deal with it in, at length because uh, I, uh, the time does not allow it. Yeah? Uh, so there is a distinction between Islam and Islamism in treating minorities. It's better to be treated as a minority by Islam than by Islamism. But the Sharia state is an Islamist rule. Um, and again, uh, uh, be reminded of the three meaning of the Sharia. Sharia in the Quran, Sharia in the Quran is ethics. Sharia in uh, uh, tradition, traditional Sharia is about worship, about civil law, and about uh, uh, penal law. Like if, if you drink wine, uh, you, you, you can be subjected to a penalty. Uh, but uh, Sharia is not an order of the state. This is the third meaning of Sharia. And it, is, it has been introduced by, uh, by Islamists. Uh, the founder of, Islamist, uh, of Islamism, his name is Hassan al-Banna. He did this in Cairo, uh, I mean, nearby Cairo in Ismailia, uh, in the year uh, 1928. And he speak of the Sharia. And his understanding of Sharia is the Sharia. And if you do not accept it, then you are against the Sharia. I, I accept Sharia as ethics. And in my life, I try to practice Sharia as ethics. Uh, but Sharia as a law is not acceptable to me because uh, this is constructed by humans. This is not in the Quran. And, and Sharia as a constitution is something uh, is not acceptable for people who, who want real democracy. Yeah? And, and uh, there, is a, there is a Spanish uh, foundation, is, uh, the Fride Foundation is in Madrid. And they published a paper uh, last year under the name Tyranny of the Majority with a question mark. And they say, uh, and the author of this paper is an Egyptian scholar, Egyptian legal scholar, and he studied the program of Islamists in, in Egypt and in Tunisia. And he came to this conclusion. Uh, they have one interpretation of Sharia, and it is their own, and they institute this as the law of the state. This is, uh, this is wrong, but the second, the second wrong is more consequential. Because, you see, uh, a person, a Swiss person, might, might criticize a uh, Swiss constitution, or in Germany, I, I may criticize the Deutsche Verfassung des Grundgesetz, I mean, intellectually or legally, but, you see, because, you see, the constitution is made by humans. So when I criticize the constitution, uh, on whatever level, this, uh, you are criticizing humans. But if you say Sharia is, comes from God, it's based on a revelation. So if you criticize Sharia, you are criticizing uh, what God has revealed. Then the danger, if you criticize what God has revealed, you cannot be a Muslim. And so you leave the community and you subject yourself to takfir. Takfir is excommunication or banishment from the Islamic Ummah. This is uh, the, the community, the global community of Islam. And therefore, uh, uh, Sharia is for Muslims who really want democracy is not acceptable. And even, even more for minorities, because minorities ha have uh, very limited rights under Sharia. When, 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 when moderate Islamists are in rule, when radical Islamists are in rule, uh, minorities have no rights at all. Like, this is maybe the difference between Sudan and Egypt. Yeah? And uh, the tatbiq al-sharia in Sudan, it is a catastrophe for Christians. Uh, but for 
uh, in Egypt, uh, it is, uh, I mean, so no, no Christian can be the president of Egypt. The Christians are not allowed to enter some professions, etc. This is discrimination, but uh, no one touches on their life. But radical Muslims or radical Islamists have been burning churches. I thought it's only a few dozens of churches were burned, but John is more knowledgeable than I. You, you, you mentioned this, the number? 80. Eight, 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 80 churches were burned. Yeah, this is... This is this, uh, this is a catastrophe. Yeah? In, a, in a country, Egypt was is, uh, famous for its tolerance. Yeah? So the fate of minorities in a Sharia state is, uh, can be viewed as an expression of violation of human rights. Uh, and therefore, the Sharia state is neither a democracy nor, uh, nor a blessing for minorities. Now I come to the conclusions of my presentation. Um, I start with the statement that the Middle East is undergoing a great crisis. Uh, and uh, uh, the crisis has nothing to do with religion. The crisis is related uh, f uh, uh, to the cleavage between the growth of population and field development. So there are three, three uh, many, many things happen in the Arab world. The, there is no one Arab world because uh, Egypt is a highly developed society comparing with Libya. Tunisia is a highly civil society compared with Algeria, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there are great differences within the Arab world, uh, culturally, religiously, and also with, uh, with regard to politics and society. But there are three features shared by all of them. One, the growth of the population. It's uh, tremendous. Uh, so one, 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 one demographs uh, thought when, if the Germans would, uh, would increase as much the people in Gaza, the Palestinians in Gaza, there will be today, instead of 80 million Germans, 2 billion. Yeah? Uh, the, this, is, I mean, this is a statistical uh, calculation. So uh, the growth of the population, number two, field development, economic growth is minimal or not existing, uh, and third, uh, generation, uh, the younger generation, the younger generation, the no future generation. And there are many uh, responses to this. One response is democratization. One response is uh, uh, demographic policies to, you see, if, if poor people should not have 10 children. Yeah? We, I, I do not go for the Chinese solution, one kid, one child. Yeah? But it, the, the, you, you can convince the people without coercion. If you don't have money, like when I talk to poor people in Egypt, I say, you believe in Allah? And they said, yes, you see. But Allah asks you to treat what he gives you in a proper way. He said, yes. And he said, children are, are a, a present from God, but if you do not give these children food, education, shelter, so you are not treating well. So you are, you are, you are treating the present of God uh, in, in, in a bad way. So you, you, are, you are insulting God. And people become hurt. He said, you are right. Yeah? So you should not have 10 children. Yeah? And uh, so the, uh, this demographic uh, uh, curve of the population, uh, better economic development, democratization. But, but the, is the Islamists, the Islamists, they say, al-hal huwa al-Islam. The solution is Islam. But I mean, is Islam is a religion. If, if people uh, stop drinking wine, and, and go to bars, will, will the situation improve? If the, 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 uh, uh, the police of, uh, uh, of, of surveilling how people follow the Sharia, will this, will, 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 will this be the solution? No. Uh, the Islam who al-hal, Islam is the solution. Yeah? And uh, Islam is for them Sharia Islam and the Sharia state. Yeah? Um, however, Islamists are... Uh, uh, I mean, there are many Islamist movements. The most important one of them is the, is the Muslim Brotherhood of Egypt. And many, many movements are, uh, they, they come up from this movement. In, in, in Tunisia, you, the, uh, you have uh, another. In, um, in, uh, in Gaza Strife, you have the, uh, you have the, uh, the Hamas. Yeah? Uh, you cannot ov overlook this movement. Uh, there's a distinction in English between two terms, engagement and empowerment. In terms of democracy, uh, there are two solutions, uh, the Algerian solution and the Turkish solution. The Algerian solution is get rid of the Islamists, surve surveil them, uh, uh, distinguish them, uh, oppress them, I mean, we do whatever with them, and move them away. 
This is not acceptable. Yeah? This is absolutely not acceptable. This is the Algerian way of dealing with Islamists. And it, has, it, it has been practiced since the 1990s. And that's why Arab Spring could not reach uh, uh, Algeria. Uh, the Turkish, uh, this is ex exclusion. The Turkish solution is inclusion. See, allow uh, Islamists to uh, engage in politics, to participate in the political game. Uh, however, unlike the Turkish solution, I do not go for empowerment. Uh, one should prevent empowerment of Islamists because when they come to power, th this will be the end of democracy. This will, then you have the Sharia state. Yeah? So uh, it is very difficult. I mean, I, I had difficulties in explaining this to people who interviewed me in the past two days in Zurich. Said, you want to engage them, but you do not want al to allow them to have the power. So how want to, uh, you want to manage this? Th they say this is a, a problem of policy. Yeah? But, uh, uh, if, if you do not engage with them, you have to suppress them, and this is against democracy. And if you allow them to be empowered, when the Islamist uh, uh, empowerment uh, was supported by the United States, this is not a promotion of democracy. So this is a dilemma, and I, 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 uh, I accept this, and I concede this. Yeah? Um, uh, paired with keeping the distinction between uh, Islam as a faith and Islamism as a, as a political religion, I, uh, I develop and unfold a critique of a human rights violation uh, in the Middle East and North Africa by Islamist movement, but also by others. Yeah, um, and in particular the Christians. Yeah, in uh, there is a ten tendency or, or a trend of de-Christianization of the Middle East. Uh, Christians, I mean, at least those who are well-to-do and have the means to uh, do that. They migrate to Europe and to the United States of America and also to South America. Yeah? So in, in Iraq, we used to have, uh, under Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein was a dictator, but he was favorable to the Christians. There were about 5% of the Iraqi uh, citizens were Christians. Today, in average, 1%, maybe more or less. But so <coughs> the other 4%, they left the country. Yeah? The same is taking place in Egypt. In Lebanon, the Christians used to be the majority of the population, and they're still in the constitution. But uh, a lot of Christians left Lebanon, and they live now in the United States. And now the, uh, the greatest uh, uh, segment of the population in, uh, in Lebanon are the Shi'i Muslims. And that's why Hezbollah is very strong. Yeah? And so uh, this, if, if you want to maintain the rights of minorities, you have to step the strength of de-Christianization in the Middle East. Christians should have their place in the Middle East. And this is one, not only to, to, to keep the, uh, the rights of the Christian, but to keep in general also the human rights uh, problem. Is it allowed to talk about this? There is a new notion, there are two notions. Can I speak more five minutes? Sure. Five minutes, okay. Uh, um, I was friends with Edward Said. Some of you might know of him. Edward Said, this is a, bi a very big name. Edward Said is a Palestinian American. He was not famous, but became famous when, when he, in 1979, published a book, Orientalism. And uh, Orientalism is uh, how Westerners view Islam. Well, Edward Said was a Christian, uh, but he, he was defending Islam. Uh, how Westerners view Islam with prejudice, and the world of Islam with prejudice, and this is orientalizing the Orient. And this is Orientalism. And Orientalism, but he was right because he wanted he wanted to fight against prejudice, which I support. And Edward Said and I, we are friends. And we, uh, my first publication in English, 1973, in a book, The Arabs of Today, uh, Prospects for Tomorrow, was together with Edward Said. 73 yeah? uh, to now, this is 40 years ago. Yeah? Uh, but, but later on, he exaggerated. And one of my Syrian friends accused him of developing an Orientalism in reverse. Orientalism, you say, people of the Orient are bad people. But if you switch this, say they are all good people, this is Orientalism in reverse. But so Orientalism became uh, an instrument of censorship. It was not allowed in, in the in Middle, East, Middle Eastern studies of the United States uh, have been deteriorating in the past. In er maybe 10 years ago were the leading studies in the world. Today, no longer the case. Yeah? And the reason for this is the, uh, uh, the taining of Islamic studies with the accusation of Islamophobia, if you, uh, with the Orientalism. So if uh, I was even, I myself, I was, you know, I, I come from an aristocratic, traditional Islamic family of Damascus. 
and they say you are, uh, you are practicing in your writing Orientalism, said, come on, hey, stop it. Or in American, say, give me a break. Yeah? Uh, uh, you see, I, I am a Muslim, you are Christians, you are blonde, and I'm, I, I'm a Middle Easterner, and you accuse me of Orientalism. You say, okay, you are not Orientalist, but you are Orientalizing yourself, yeah? self-Orientalization. Yeah? And the second step that it happened in the last 10 years, this is worse than Islam, this is, uh, Orientalism, the accusation of Islamophobia. If you criticize Islamism, but you see, I'm not talking about Islam. I'm not talking about the religious of Islam. I'm talking about Islamism. You are accused of Islamophobia. And that's why the last chapter of my book, uh, The Sharia State, deals, is it allowed today in scholarship and in the media to speak critically about what's going on in the Middle East and North Africa in particular, and the world in Islam in general? It must be allowed. And uh, the only part of the world where you have freedom of speech is the United States and Western Europe. But this is dwindling. And the freedom of speech in the, in the name of political correctness, in the name of fighting Islamophobia and Orientalism becomes less and less. And I fight for it. It must be allowed to talk about this. And the bottom line is when we come to this team, uh, the fate of my religious minorities in the Middle East is not promising, to say the least. Uh, uh, I have worries about religious minorities in the Middle East uh, and their conditions of the present development, and it must be allowed in the name of democracy and human rights to talk ab about uh, these problems. Yeah? Um, freedom of uh, f uh, sp speech and vigilant observation of human rights violation must be allowed in the name of democracy. Yeah? For individual Christian, it, it seems to be safe today to, to seek refuge in, uh, in the West. Yeah? Um, but this is not the general solution. The solution is uh, we have uh, to, to, to face uh, uh, head on the pro existing problems. The major problems have nothing to do with the religion of Islam. They are economic, social, and political. But these problems are religionized. This is, I, I end with this. I have, in the past 10 years, I have introduced a term to the English language and also to the German language. Yeah? Uh, if you look in the dictionary, you will not fi you'll find the word religion, but not a verb of it. A verb of religion is to religionize, religionisieren. Uh, that means uh, there, there are, in Egypt, there are social problems. Uh, uh, unemployment, health, education, etc. But if you say the West is responsible for this and the Christian West is suppressing us and you make out of this a Christian uh, Islamic problem, so you religionize social economic problems. Uh, we, should, uh, we, should be be we should beware of this religionization of the problems. We should face the problems head on. And I think only a common cooperation between the West, in particular Europe, I think uh, Europe is more important more important uh, to, uh, uh, to the Middle East and the Middle East to Europe than the United States. The United States is far away. Yeah? But you see, when, when something happens in the Middle East, you have refugees. Uh, uh, all problems in the Middle East have spillover effects in Europe. That's why Europe must be interested in uh, protecting human rights and democracy and also helping uh, Middle Easterners to solve their problems. Uh, but in order to solve the pro these problems, we must, and this is my last uh, sentence, we must have the freedom to identify the problems and freely talk about them in the context of freedom of speech, including uh, the fate of minorities. If we are not allowed to do this in the name of political correctness, uh, then, uh, then forget it. Yeah? And the, the last thing is in the UN Commission of Human Rights, there are two states we are, which are uh, uh, highly engaged, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, they are highly engaged in preventing this debate. And they say this is Islamophobia. And, uh, but in, in Saudi Arabia and in Pakistan, there is no freedom of speech, uh, and there is no respect for religious minorities. But how these countries, they allow themselves to, to capture the United Nations as a forum for promoting the policies. We should not listen to them. We should not buy in what they're uh, in, uh, in their call. They, they, they want to establish a, an international law against blasphemy. But this is, a, in fact, this is an international law against freedom of speech. We should not allow this. And thank you for giving me this forum. And I'm available to you for this. Question.